This is where we left it off last time. Any problem starts in the physical space or the geometric space, and we're presented with a physical or geometric integral that we understand on an intuitive level. And then for practical applications, of course, what we want to do is convert it into an arithmetic integral. And that's what we figured out last time, a nice way to do it. We kind of got 90% of the way there, because what we achieved was a recipe that at the very least gives the same answer regardless of parametrization. And I usually don't write words on the board, but this one I'll write because it's my favorite word in all of math, and it's invariance. So what we achieved was invariance. This integral will give the same answer, and that's what we demonstrated, regardless of how you parametrize the curve. Now, a quick disclaimer that I should have made. So part of this recipe includes the limits, and I'd like to specify that the limit always goes from the lower number to the greater number. And then you get into lots of issues, very interesting issues to deal with, that have to do with what happens when the parametrization go increases in the opposite direction. You get into a whole lot of questions with regard to signs. And then you have to look at that very carefully and find a very careful, robust approach so that signs always work out and you always get the right answer and not minus the right answer. So when we solve practical problems, sometimes we don't care about signs too much because if we calculate the mass and get the answer of minus five kilograms, we realize that we just screwed up the sign and just take the absolute value at the end. So we have a tendency to do that a little bit. So that's not the right way to do it. The right way to do it is to think it through and do it right from the beginning. But that's something that I'll save for later, thinking about signs. For now, I'll add a few caveats that take care of the signs for us. And the caveats are, so part of the recipe is that the limits of integration go from small, from the b is greater than a, okay? And part of the recipe was a physical or geometric or invariant field p that's arbitrarily defined on the curve. And what we have in the recipe is the derivative of its manifestation with respect to the selected parameter. So we should additionally stipulate that P increases in the same direction as the parameter. So if gamma increases from left to right, or let's say along this direction, that P should increase along that direction also, or else we'll get the wrong sign. And also, when we change variables, when we change parameters, uh, more generally, this would be called change of coordinates. So when we change the coordinate, it's also changed in such a way that the new parametrization, capital gamma, also increases in the same direction. So as long as everything is oriented the same way, the integrals will be the right sign, and we'll never run into an issue with signs or limits of integration. So I'll just add it as a caveat. If you don't have these caveats, if you allow parametrizations to increase in this direction or in that direction, so give yourself complete freedom of choice. Then you have to be careful about the signs and you have to think it through and you have to do several right things. So good. Okay, so here is where we stopped last time. We realized that, subject to the caveat I just mentioned, that for any P that's arbitrarily chosen before you start formulating your arithmetic integrals, that this integral would be invariant. Once again, meaning that if we introduced an alternative parameter and followed the same recipe, now these are still relatively compact formulas, but the words that they imply are plenty. So for example, it says what you need to do is introduce a parameter gamma, then the whatever field that you're integrating f that's defined on the curve becomes a function of gamma, the invariant field P becomes a function of gamma as well. Then you take its derivative, then you multiply them together, and then you take the conventional calculus AP integral from that correspond to the limits of the parametrization. So a lot of words, right? This nice compact formula, once you spell it out, it's actually a lengthy recipe. And what we've discovered is if you follow this recipe with respect to the parameter gamma, or an alternative parameter, capital gamma, 
you will get the same answer. And that's what we mean by the word invariance, that you get the same number regardless of parametrization. That while the parametrization might vary, the value of this integral will not vary. And to me, that's good enough. I think that when you achieve invariance, even if you're not sure of what that number means, yes, we evaluated an arithmetic integral, it gave the number seven, then you did it in a different parametrization, you calculated this other integral and it was once again seven. Now you might not know what does that seven mean? Does it correspond to what we intuitively think this value is? So the point that I'm trying to make is, even if it doesn't, I'm already pleased. Because to me, invariance is of primary interest compared to actually representing some physical quantity. Because with invariance, we've achieved internal consistency, whereas we are studying something real, something that doesn't depend on your arbitrary choice of parametrization, but something that's a little bit bigger than that. So it's already interesting. So you may completely dismiss this comment because it's mostly a comment about how you feel about something. It's an aesthetic comment. It, I'm just saying, I already like it. Uh, you don't need to like it. You can just dismiss that comment, but I just wanted to make that comment because I like what I like. Okay. So let's now add the element that most other people would think it's very important, and that is that this integral should correspond to our intuitive integral of the physical integral, which is really, we define as the total amount of whatever f represents uh, along the curve. So how do we achieve that? And I'll just remind you that maybe our intuitive feeling implies the limiting process where we break up the curve into small pieces, take the length of each piece, whatever that means. I maintain that uh, the concept of, the, of an integral is no more or less complicated or mysterious than the concept of length itself. They're completely intertwined. But our intuitive approach to maybe even calculating this integral is to break up the curve into small segments take the length of each segment, multiply bar and arbitrary by the value of f at an arbitrary point within the little segment, add them up, and take the limit as the partition size of the partition goes to zero. Okay, so that's our intuitive understanding of what this integral means. So what do we need to do to make this arithmetic integral not just be invariant, with respect to changes in parametrization, but actually give the same value? And the answer is very simple. It's to let P be arc length S that starts at an arbitrary point where S equals zero. That part doesn't matter, obviously, because it's only the differences in S that matter. Orientation does matter, but I've already caveated that. So that's, that's the answer. So let me write down what the answer is and then convince you there's only one quick check that we need to make to see that it's true. So arc length s, by virtue of being an invariant field, by invariant here, I mean something that you've defined along the curve before coordinates or the parameter gamma got introduced in the first place. You know, introducing p means saying p equals a certain value at this point, another value at this point, another value at this physical point, another value at this point, and so on. Right? That's all that was required of P. Oh, that it's differentiable, but yeah. Okay, so S is certainly a field like that. Because I, when I look at the curve before the parameter was ever introduced, I can say S equals zero here, it equals one here, two here, three here, four here, minus one over here, right, and so on. So it was an invariant field. So it works here, so if I put it, put it in, then again I have an integral, I have a recipe that's completely invariant under the change of parameters, so it's a success. So partials, almost a complete success. So how, why does it correspond to this? Well, let me, so, we we'll already know that it, the value of the integral does not depend on the parameter. So let me choose 
one particular parameter. Before I do that, is the noise bothering you guys? Should we close the windows and suffer the heat? All right. And so for that, sp so let's discover what this integral means by choosing one specific parameter. And of course, I'll choose the parameter gamma equals s, right? That's a special parameterization, right? I can, regardless of the value of the parameter, regardless of my choice of parameterization, the value of the integral will be the same. So let's, ha let's see what happens when I put this in. And of course, what happens is, well, now I'll rewrite it. It'll be integral from whatever the value here is, let's say it says zero, to whatever the value here it is, maybe it says S1, so it goes from S0 to S1, F, referred to S, I like the word referred, meaning whatever function it becomes as a function of arc length, F referred to S, times the derivative of s with respect to s, well, that's just 1, right, and ds. That's what that integral equals for this particular choice of the parameter. Now, there's a big difference between this and this. This is the geometric integral as we intuitively defined it, and this is an arithmetic integral. When you choose arc length, this becomes a function of s, maybe it's sine of s. Maybe it's e to the s, but it's that sort of mapping. A number goes in, a number comes out. This is a very different sort of thing. This doesn't have a variable. This is only defined on points, right? So this is an arithmetic integral, okay? But if we think about, so why does this equal this? Well, again, I'll, I'll ask you to think back to the intuitive approach that uses limits. So this is an integral that takes place in the arithmetic space, right? This is what it looks like. This is S0. This is S1. Somewhere over here it's S equals 0. Then somewhere it's 1 and 2 and so on. Here we went up to 4. So, you know, maybe it goes up to here. That's not important, right? So that's where this integral happens in your calculus AP sort of picture. And what's one of the ways of defining a definite integral, and that is to break up this segment into, into small segments, so introduce a partition, and then find a Riemann sum and make it go, and make the, and consider the limit as the size of the partition goes to zero. And you will find that whatever Riemann sums you find here correspond to the exact same sums that you find here because I was saying the exact same things. Right, because the length of this segment corresponds to the width of the par partitioning element here, and so on. So you will find, however intuitively you understand these integrals, this arithmetic integral and this uh, physical or geometric integral are approached in the limit by the same partial sums. Does that kind of make sense? So. That's what I've been trying to do here. Sort of, you know how I said in the first lecture, and now we're kind of coming full circle, that math starts in the middle. So math does start in the middle, but that means you still have to choose a starting point that's also in the middle. And we've had a couple of starting points. One is that we're in the middle. One, we accepted this on an intuitive level. And another one was arithmetic integrals and the fundamental theorem of calculus and the chain rule. We didn't dive deeper into those. Those were our starting point. But given those arbitrary starting points, I think this narrative is pretty linear and connects all of them in a consistent way. What's good about this? Now you have a tool for analyzing specific problems. Yes, it will require a little bit further development, but all of the elements are there. And the most important element is that when you have a curve you're not forced to refer it to arc length, which in some ways is very difficult, if not impossible. And at the very least inconvenient, unless it's the circle. Or maybe a helix. But even with a helix, it's a little bit messy. With a circle, it's clean. But those are really the only curves that I can think of where arc length parameterization is relatively convenient. 
and, all, and for any other curve, it's not practical. But now you have a recipe where you can introduce a convenient parameter, and you have a perfectly good algorithm for calculating integrals. The only question is, how do you evaluate this? And that's a question that we'll address next.